Okay, well, uh, let's start then with, with uh, I, I don't, you don't need an introduction because uh, everyone uh, knows you obviously, but can you tell me what are you working on now? Is it like applications? Fratna uh, uh, like just showed this, or you're working on the toolbox for, for, for gene editing? Well, in principle, we work on, uh, on f fundamental research. We, uh, we think that's very important. Uh, but of course, uh, and, and that's typical for uh, research at Wageningen University, we, uh, we select our uh, research topics in such a way that, that whenever it leads to a successful uh, um, uh, or potential uh, uh, features, then it's, it's relatively straightforward to, uh, to, uh, to, to find uh, applications and to find parties that, uh, that want to collaborate with us on developing those, uh, those applications. So, so, so currently, as, as, as Pratna uh, said, uh, we, we are uh, uh, trying to, uh, to, uh, to work on some of the challenges that, uh, that uh, are there with the, with the currently uh, used uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, systems. So, and we, uh, as, as, as has been shown, we are working on, on several research lines and, and leading us, hopefully, to, uh, to, uh, to new uh, uh, applications uh, okay. in the near future. Okay, thank you. I have sound. So yeah, it works. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the, the, the panel before uh, 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 discussed about the question. Someone in the panel before, I think it was Sias uh, Ackerman or maybe the Alfred, uh, said, do we need gene editing? And, and Louise, we just had a report from the UN saying that in 2050 we will be, we'll have around 10 billion uh, people around. Since we, well, let's speak for myself. Since I was born, world population has more than doubled, so another three. We managed without gene editing, <laughs> obviously, to feed most of these people. Do we need this? Uh, uh, I'm sort of putting together genetic techniques like GMOs and gene editing. Well, first of all, this is, oh, do I have sound by any chance? Okay, okay. okay. we'll try. No, yes? No? No? Yeah. Maybe well, we can solve. <laughs> Thank you, Such a You're generous. A uh, so, first of all, I would like to put the discussion about CRISPR Cas and GMO in a slightly wider context. This is not just about food security or food safety, it's about a lot more things. Secondly, um, this is not only about improving the genetics. Um, there is no point in having a better uh, genetically engineered plant, even through a classical breeding, if the whole production system itself doesn't have the same qualities. Because the genes cannot be expressed unless you have sufficient fertilizer, sufficient water, a whole system needs to be in place. So it's precision agriculture within which precision breeding is a tool in whatever way. Thirdly, yes, we are an institution that is about um, science for impact. But science for impact is something else uh, than just going immediately for the applications. Uh, we need all the best tools to deal with a whole range of problems, whether it's food security, food safety, environmental pressures, and so on. Um, and CRISPR-Cas or GMO are one of the tools. But most importantly for us as a scientific institution is that these kinds of tools and discoveries help us to push the frontiers of science and understand the system much better. So I would be really very hesitant to ask our institution to only do applied things from a perspective of is it needed or not. When the work on CRISPR-Cas, even your work but even before that started, nobody was thinking about applications for food security. But this happens to be a piece of fundamental research with an enormous, tremendous application. And this will happen again and again. I mean, the fact that we all have our mobile phones is thanks to Einstein. Well, Einstein didn't think about mobile phones or whatever. So we must be careful not to harness uh, fundamental research too much by asking for applications. Now, I'm the first one, of course, given my background, to, to really believe in doing something for food security, but I also want to keep as wide as possible scientific contributions. And last but not, but not least, Joes, we must understand that if we here in Europe or we here at Wageningen would limit ourselves scientifically, this would lead to, to real risks to the level playing field within countries and between countries. Uh, other parts of the world are moving ahead. And the worst thing that can happen is that Europe is so far behind that it doesn't understand anymore what kind of innovations are being developed uh, elsewhere. And if we don't understand, we, don't, we cannot regulate it. 
Yeah, the, the, uh, that's the idea of Europe as the, the, well, Venice is the example, but Europe as a museum. But it, it, there's also ways, I'm, not, I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate now, but there's also room for, for what they call the, the, the organic movement, where you, you well. I think the, uh, the real test will be that actually the organic movement starts to use the most modern breeding techniques. Because then you can really do away with a lot of the chemicals that uh, are now uh, in, in many of the production systems. Mm -hmm. So what kind of applications can we think of that are very useful? Well, drought resistance is one that's, that's really important. Uh, food quality, food um, shelf life, for example, for tomatoes. All those things are very practical applications. Can we do it differently? Perhaps. But it may not be possible, and it may also not be possible to do it uh, at a, in, with the right type of speed. I think potato, if I may, is a very good example. As you know, about half of the, the, the chemicals in agriculture are used on, on potato, particularly for a fungus disease. Uh, there is no resistance. It's impossible. The sensitivity is so great and the uh, pathogen is, is uh, mutating so rapidly that we need to have other tools at our disposal. And some of these tools, in this case with potato, it's not, as some of you know, it's not a GMO nor a CRISPR-Cas, but it's another type of mutagenesis coming or it's from, from a wild relative uh, through cisgenesis. Those are tools that are really important. So I want the whole toolbox to be as appropriate as possible and not step one. And maybe I can also say something. You, you, you said, uh, uh, do we need it? Uh, I think, well, the, the food implications, uh, that, that's just one of the uh, potential applications. So other possibilities are in the field of the, of the bi biotechnology. So then we are dealing with uh, microorganisms like bacteria or yeast or, or algae uh, to, to produce all kind of uh, interesting uh, compounds. And of course, and that has been uh, during the, the previous panel discussion, it, uh, it has been mentioned, uh, uh, we, we, we can use it to, uh, to cure human uh, disease. So I, I, I would say, yes, we do need it to, uh, to, to really, uh, well, help uh, uh, Humanity, or to 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 to, to create a ba better place. Yeah, yeah. I get the, the I, uh, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, I get the impression that we had a discussion about mobile phones 20 years ago, and lots of people said, "Why do would you need a mobile phone?" And if you look now, <laughs> it's we we never knew how to do without it. But let me go on with you, John. Uh, uh, we were also, the last panel was also talking about the risks like the non-target effects or maybe uh, the runaway genes or uh, the effects on the ecosystem. Uh, how do you evaluate this? Can we deal with those risks? Uh, I think we can. Uh, <coughs> indeed, uh, when, when the Cas9 system, as, as Pratna pointed out, it was the, the first system that was uh, developed uh, back in, uh, in 2012 uh, and, and then the revolution uh, started. And then it was found uh, in, in several publications that has been uh, reported that the, uh, if, if you just use it to, uh, to, to target the gene, to generate uh, a break in the, uh, at the DNA level and rely on a kind of a quick and dirty system to, to repair the break. So, so that is the system that, that uh, as was mentioned in the movie also, that is being used to, to inactivate uh, a gene. It, it has been found that, that uh, that apart from those uh, quick and dirty uh, uh, repair events uh, in which there is uh, relatively little uh, change at the DNA level, also major uh, changes uh, occur. Uh, and uh, yeah. and those, those major changes, uh, I mean, th those have been, uh, uh, or, or that's, that's part of the problem. Yeah. And that indeed is, is something that has been observed by, by, by several colleagues, or I heard about that. Uh, some of, uh, also, it has been, of course, published. Uh, uh, and but but I mean the good thing is uh, is that we can we can check um, uh, what is what is the outcome of the uh, of the experiment and especially with uh, with plants but also with, with microorganisms of course then uh, we can we can because of the sequencing technologies we can we can just look at the, uh, the the final product and then select the one that that fits perfectly with what we uh, designed. Yeah, uh, Louise. Okay. Can I borrow this? Um, I think one of the things we should not do is to get the feeling that we uh, can prevent every single problem in advance. 
uh, I think science is a learning process, the application is a learning process also for society. And if I may make a very simplistic analogy, if you think of the car, the first cars that were introduced 150 or maybe even earlier years ago, they were deadly weapons. They had no brakes, no lights. We didn't also know how to, to use them. There, there were no traffic lights. Um, it was all very complicated. But over the time, we learned not only to make the technology much better, so the car itself, but we also uh, educated drivers and we educated the public not to stand in the middle of the road. And so in the end, we have learned how to deal with a lot of things. Um, so you, you can't just blame the technology for not doing everything and having side effects. What you have to do is to make sure, and that's why science is so important, uh, that you have a self-correcting process and that you have the kinds of assessments that make it sure to uh, really react to problems as soon as possible. Maybe, maybe, uh, sorry, maybe, <laughs> maybe I can add something there uh, from a scientific point. So when it was realized that that it was not without mistakes, people started to work on that. And, and so what has been done is basically two things. So, so one approach was to, uh, to do protein engineering of Cas9 to get more specific uh, variants, and that worked out uh, amazingly well. And the other thing, and that was uh, again mentioned by, by Pratna, when we uh, found or when we started to characterize this alternative, so the Cas12 uh, system, then we found that that is much more uh, specific, as is the, the thermo uh, Cas9 system that, that Pratna mm. mentioned as well. So, so both in nature and by protein engineering, we already uh, reached uh, a much higher level of, uh, of precision with these uh, editing yeah, but, uh, but events. But do you, do you have a sort of, when it's going, let's say it's in the field, like an experimental field, do you have a turn off knob to, to, to switch off the... the, the no, of course. I mean, when, when it's in the field, uh, um, there will be additional mutations. But I mean, the starting point starts with a single cell. And that is something you can uh, exactly check as, as it is being done with classical uh, mutagenesis or, or, or breeding. Yeah. Uh, and what happens in the field, of course, uh, it, it, it evolves. And, and uh, 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 during every cell division, uh, uh, mistakes occur uh, at the copying of one DNA molecule to the other one. So, yeah, so yeah. that is something that we have to take into account. And as the chair of the previous meeting said, we are all uh, mutants, so <laughs> and that's how it is. And so also all the plants in the field, they are all mutants. Yeah, yeah. but then the... the, the yeah, <laughs> the, the, the former, uh, in the former panel, there was also mention of, of, of eradicating uh, malaria mosquitoes with gene drive. And I think many people have, are dreading this kind of experiment because, you know, you don't know where it ends. It's like <laughs> letting loose the rabbits in Australia, uh, something like that, you know. The, Okay, well, the gene drives, I must say, we, or it, that's my personal opinion, I think we should be careful there, uh, for the time being at least. So, and that's, I think, the, the general view. Uh, yeah. so, so, uh, so I think there, there still needs to be a lot of testing uh, inside confined uh, environments, so inside labs, uh, uh, before we can uh, ever, uh, or we, we can release uh, organisms into the environment. Uh, so also with the, uh, with the malaria uh, trick to, uh, or, or the mosquito trick and the gene drives to, uh, to try to, uh, to fight uh, uh, malaria, I think that will need a lot of time, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm afraid you have to return to, to, to Africa with that message, and I'm sorry about that, but I, 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 I think we should be very careful, and I think that's also important to, 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 to mention here. So in case we are not absolutely sure that things will, will work out the way we, uh, we want it to, then we should uh, for sure not release it into the free. Uh. But when we say we, oh, finally, we are here. Um, <laughs> I exist. When we say we, we have to be very careful. Who is we in this case? Well, there is no we. You have scientists, you have governments, you have the public, there are all kinds of parties, private companies. And uh, my, my main worry is that there is no uh, central authority, no even no agreement, not even within the UN, on how we are going to deal this, uh, with this. So my um, proposal would be that we start um, setting up a monitoring system and a public database where 
all the mutations as well as the, um, the applications are actually registered and that we also register the field trials and the introduction into the environment so that at least we can keep track of things. We don't know at all what's happening uh, and if it's not published scientifically or if it's not published in another way, we cannot find it. And so the first way is to get a, an overall database mm. that we get some, uh, some understanding of what is happening. Like the database for clinical trials? Uh, for example, yes. So you have to but, put forward what you're going to do with But this is not only at the trial stage, but also at the introduction stage. And I think it's very important to make sure that we put the responsibility there where it has to be. And this is obviously, in my view, but I'm of course a bit biased, uh, something that can only be done at an intergovernmental level. You cannot leave that to public institutions at a national level, nor to the private mm -hmm. sector. Yeah. So far about risk, but from the former discussions about genetic modification, which started all 40 years ago, uh, uh, something like that, you know, yeah, recombinant true. DNA, uh, I'm talking uh, old <laughs> times now. Uh, but we learned that the debate is not only about the risks, it's also about values. And there was some mention here as well that you have, uh, we shouldn't play God, we shouldn't dabble with nature. Uh, the other one is a very important one, which mentioned, was also mentioned, was who's benefiting? It's, it, is it the five or, I should say, big seed companies? Do they set the stage who's benefiting from it? So how, how, how could you address these values? Because you have your own values as a scientist or as a uh, politician. Uh, and it went wrong with the GMO. So how can we sort of... Try yeah, to it went wrong with the GMO, I think, because the first applications were really quite unpalatable for the, for the larger public. Mm. As you remember, this was um, herbicide resistance in large-scale mechanized agriculture for a feed crop, uh, so feed for animal feed. So it was it sort of triggered all the wrong uh, feelings everywhere. If the first GMO application had been to build in a brassica gene into wheat to protect against um, um, uh, stomach cancer, I think the debate today would have been very different. So it's very important for us now to select a few success stories for CRISPR-Cas that really make a difference. And the, the, the area that would be most uh, appropriate, in my view, would be an application in the area of drought resistance. Uh, because that is an issue in, in many parts of the world, not just in the developing world. It's a real issue with climate change or weather variability. So that, that those are some of the values. The values can be, must be, about applications that are relevant to the public at large, and particularly, of course, to people who are most vulnerable. But again, I want to make that plea. It's not uh, uh, wise to limit science only to those applications. We must have sufficient mm. fundamental science to do that. Uh, otherwise, we don't have this backup of, of, of yeah, good but ideas. Eventually, it'll be. Yeah, it'll be but going the question you ask is really a question about property and access. That's the second that's, one. That's yeah, what we're, we're talking about. And, and so, who will have access? And um, there is a lot of discussion in the CRISPR Cas uh, community and the public at large that this should be regulated under so called breeders' rights. I'm not sure that everybody knows what yeah, breeders' instead rights. Instead of patents, are. you mean? Yeah, instead of, of, of patents. The, um, uh, to understand this well, because I, I think it's important to clear up some misunderstandings there. So breeders' rights are a, a specific uh, form of intellectual property protection, which allows two sorts of exceptions. One is that the uh, material can remain accessible to breeders to continue breeding. Um, so in a sense, it is in a kind of public domain. And the second one is that farmers, if they were already collecting seeds on their own fields to do their own multiplication, could also have this, what is called the farmer's privilege. So there are two exceptions, two ways in which the intellectual property of a, a variety development, in this case, purely in plants, is regulated so that it stays to some extent in the public domain. The breeders' rights are regulated under the so-called UPOF Convention, which is a, a specific uh, convention. I think it dates from 61, 1961. But here's the snag. Only a limited number of countries in the world subscribe to this. And UPOF is an intergovernmental uh, organization. For example, the vast majority of African countries are not members or not parties, as it said technically, to the UPOF Convention. Most of the intellectual property in the, in the world is regulated under the so-called TRIPS, that's the Trade-Related Intellectual Property Rights. And TRIPS, notwithstanding what 
some people think, actually does have a possibility to limit the exclusivity of the patent. So you can make similar exceptions or somewhat comparable exceptions also under TRIPS. Now TRIPS uh, is uh, supported or signatories to the TRIPS treaty are like uh, 150 countries. So to, to, I know this is a bit technical, but it's really important to get this clear. So to only plea for breeder, breeders' rights is limiting the discussion. And my feeling would be that we need to uh, uh, deal with the property issue by getting sufficient room under the TRIPS and other national regulations for intellectual property rights because these go international things need to be translated into national law and to do that by taking the best elements of UPOF and the best so breeders rights and the best elements of the patenting system and do that in the sense of this is about the common good of mankind. So you, if you are a company like, like uh, uh, Bayer or Syngenta you have the intellectual property of a certain variety. Uh, you suggest that they would, let's say, have sort of a forced licensing or something like that? No, I think you still need, uh, I mean, plant breeders' rights is not a matter of forced licensing. Uh, companies obviously need to be um, uh, getting some return on their yeah. investment in research. That's, that's true everywhere, also in the pharmaceutical world. But what you want is that the work can continue, so so the other breeders can continue yes. on that work. That is, but that's not forced licensing. It's more a matter of of keep giving that access or ma making an exception, which is called <laughs> breeders' rights. And that that could also, I think, be discussed. We're not talking about something we can uh, mm. arrange, but it's something that on an intergovernmental level we should table to see whether we cannot do that. Then still it means that it needs to be translated into national legislation, which is an uh, other major thing. But I think it's important to open up this discussion again, because these two worlds are now very far apart, and that's going to be negative when we really want applications that go are going to make a difference. Uh, yeah, I, well, I wouldn't want to go very yeah, sorry, far sorry, into sorry, this, sorry. but... but uh, the other thing with patents is that it's obviously one of the motors of the consolidation in the seed sector. And is that a good thing, if the, the big four are sort of setting the stage for, for seed development? And that's another, th another yeah, so question. Yeah, so you want, I mean, in general, whether it's, it's food or fuel or what, whatever, you, you don't want only a few players no. in the market. I think we all agree on that. The question is, is, is how can you do that? Uh, is there really a matter of, of in unfair competition or not? Uh, in, in this particular case of the seed sector, there are some OECD reports and other assessments, and obviously the um, EU itself accepted the Monsanto Bayer fusion uh, yeah, merger. Yeah. But the, the, the thing is, the more players you can have, to some extent, the better. But it's not true that small players are necessarily better no, no, uh, no, scientists, of course. It's, it's the matter of the, the large companies setting the stage and blocking maybe all the developments or buying sure. all the developments, like in football, like the European Champions League. Yeah, the big clubs are buying all the players. And well, I wouldn't venture any comments on <laughs> soccer playing. Anyway, let's, let's go back. Uh, John, you, you, had, you got last year's Spinoza Prize, which is a very prestigious prize for researchers in, uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, then you said that you wanted to use some of the money or all of the money, I don't know, which is about, I don't know. What's about 700? No. It's a little bit more. A little bit more even. OK. <laughs> part of the money. He it didn't tell me this. <laughs> <laughs> you want to use part of the money for, for uh, communicating uh, yeah. the, the broader. Uh, how, how do you want to go about it? Oh, that's already ongoing. So, so what, I, what I did the last couple of months. So, so first of all, everybody, uh, especially in the Netherlands, now knows where to find me. So I'm invited for a lot of talks to <laughs> science cafes or, or whatever society. Uh, uh, but, but not only that, also uh, I got in, in, in touch with, uh, with uh, people uh, or with, with uh, institutes, with schools where biology teachers are being trained. Yeah. So, so that's, that's one thing. So I, I went to two of those schools already and talked to the, to the students to, uh, be, because I think it's very, very important uh, in this whole uh, debate that people know what they are talking about and, and so, so that they know what CRISPR-Cas is about and also how it compares with the classical uh, mutagenesis. Yeah, and yeah. So that's what I, uh, uh, what I uh, uh, well, discussed with, uh, with those uh, students, but also, uh, I mean, I've been at two sessions where there is kind of a, an update um, a course for biology teachers at, at high school. So also at that level, I, uh, I am, I'm active. 
And then last but not least, uh, there is uh, an initiative here in, uh, in, uh, in, in Wageningen. Uh, uh, it was already mentioned that students are, uh, are very active, uh, but also at, at, at this level. And also there, uh, they, uh, they uh, created a kind of a, a small consortium that are interacting with uh, not only uh, other institutes uh, in the Netherlands, but also uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, and they needed money, uh, so part of the Spinoza money, uh, I already promised, mm -hmm. will, uh, will flow in that direction to, to help them to, to make that work and okay. to contribute really to the, to the whole uh, debate. Right. So uh, let me ask Louise, because you're also the, the president of the board of uh, Wageningen, you were, of course. Is, is, is it part of a scientist's job to communicate and does he get credits for it? Or, and does he get coaching or is it? Well, she. Um, because she? we have quite a few women scientists yeah, sorry. as well. Sorry, he, yes. she, yes. Uh, I think all scientists or everybody working here has three major uh, roles to play, but not everybody is fit for every role in the same way. So you have to be a really very precise, like precision breeding, you also have precision human resource management in this respect. Um, first of all, education. Everybody is also supposed to be an educator in the sense of a teacher yeah. within the system. Secondly, research. We, we are an institution where we don't want to have only teachers or only research. We want people to combine that. And thirdly, it's what I would call service to society, which is more than just communicating, because communicating still suggests that um, you're there to send a message. Now, we're here also here to listen, to listen what happens in society. And when we look at our, our, our staff assessments, those three dimensions need to be taken into account. Uh, but not everybody is a great communicator, we have to accept that. And some people even have to learn how to communicate or how to listen. But it's an integral part of who you are and who we are. As I said, we, we were created 100 years ago as an institution with science for impact. And you cannot have impact if you don't listen to what happens in society. Now, the second thing is, of course, society says a lot of different things. So it's, a, it's really an art to understand what the real bottom line feeling is when you uh, look at all the social media and what is society communicating about. A lot of it is based, of course, as John says, on uh, still a lack of understanding. So in that sense, you then have a communicating role. So for us, it's very important that everybody who feels inclined and is capable of uh, goes out and communicates and talks and listens and participates. Yeah. But I think that was also one of yeah. the things that, that probably went wrong uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago with the whole bio, biotech yeah. Uh, yeah. discussion. Uh, yeah. And so, so and, and we learned from that. And, and I think that, well, CRISPR-Con is, is, is a beautiful example. I think that, that we really try hard and probably much harder than they did back uh, in yeah. the days to, yeah. to, to really yeah. I, I communicate but, with, but, with but, everybody. But, yeah, but communication is, of course, the first step. But then there's also the public involvement in, in decisions. Yeah. And, and uh, it's well, not a decisions. matter of university, maybe, but yeah. on a higher level. Maybe. How, how would we go about well, that? Ideally, in the Netherlands, actually, we have quite an interesting system we, because we have a national science agenda where uh, the government has uh, set in motion a whole process, for those of you who do not know, asking the public to ask questions to science and then uh, sort of um, analyzing those and seeing what the most important questions are. So already to some extent that agenda is taken quite seriously and funds are allocated according to the amalgamation of these questions. But secondly, of course, you want very much society to be involved, not so much in decision making. I think I couldn't really deal with society at large talking about the details of our budget. But yes, what you do want, of course, is uh, to have support for the kinds of directions you're going in and to have participation. And in science, now and more and more, we have so something called citizen science, whereby scientists uh, and uh, people from the public uh, sort of discuss what's going on and people even can collect data of how our help in the interpretation of data. This is a very good example from a completely different field is in the analysis of medieval handwriting. You yeah, know, yeah. They're, all, um, they're all online. But so, so I think there, there's far more room to do things together than we did in the past. And, and that is really different. It's also different, John, for example, from the, mm, the nuclear sure. science debate. Um, I was talking to Jennifer Doudna and she told yeah. me I can teach you CRISPR in, uh, in a matter of 10 days. So you want yeah. anyone in his backyard starting CRISPR? Uh, mm, not really. Well, you can't. You, you well, I think that, that's a bit exaggerated. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, of course. 
Uh, I mean, uh, uh, people like, like, like Pratna, uh, I mean, she, uh, she has been trained for a couple of years and now she's very good <laughs> at, at doing engineering in microorganisms. But, but now uh, she's uh, also involved in, in trying to, 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 to make the step to, uh, to plants and to, to human cells. Uh, yeah, but, but that takes really quite some, uh, some, uh, yeah, some, yeah, some yeah, effort. No, no, but uh, what I mean is that, that at a certain point in time, these, these, these uh, applications of gene editing and GMOs will be, have to be introduced in society. And you don't want to have this whole debate again. You, know, you, want, you want to have it in a, in a rational uh, way to introduce it. It's a political debate, I admit it, but... Uh, well, I think how, it will be a gradual you process. You know, yeah. Things are already uh, int uh, integrated in society, sometimes with what people even knowing. I mean, uh, I don't know whether you know that your cheese is actually made, Dutch cheese is made with genetically modified organisms. Yeah. Um, uh, insulin is made with genetically modified organisms. Uh, even organic farming uses manure from cows that have been eating genetically modified soybean. So. Uh, the question is not so much is it there, but how can we communicate in the best possible way and, and, and do this gradually exactly, and, yeah. and, and also monitor, again my plea for, for a database, monitor that uh, we, we know in time and as soon as possible the kinds of problems. But there's one group in society that we never mention uh, or rarely and that I think can play a very important role and that is artists. Um, I think uh, the, the things we've been do doing here from time to time to invite groups of artists or students from art colleges to come here and sit, for example, in, in Ernst's labs uh, to look at plant physiology, look at what we see through microscope, how we interpret it, and make a work of art that sort of links society and science and, and, and gets a better understanding. Even so of, if some of that is sometimes a little bit dystopic, it's still very important to get a broader yeah, yeah. and wider understanding and dialogue. And the dialogue goes in all directions, but I'm not so worried about that. Mm. That's, uh, so you, you try to create a narrative, more or less, by using Yeah, art. and the narrative is, is multi-stranded. It's, it's, there are more voices. There are more, there, as, as we sit in this room, we all have different opinions. And I'm, I'm not worried about that because I think, in the long term, progress goes into a certain direction. Um, and yes, yes we, we sometimes fall back and we sometimes now suddenly think that vaccination is dangerous. But in the end, with this self-correcting process of science and, and the way we deal with things and the openness, that's why democracy is so important in this case, uh, the openness that we have, we are moving forward. We are learning continuously. Is there, would there be, uh, well, I have to be quick, but would there be room for, for uh, we used to have for the GMOs a, a broad advisory commission, which only lasted for, I think, two years or three years. Would it be something f to have a, an advisory commission, broad advisory commission? I think the this, this stage has already been passed. There are so many opinions already, and, and it's not a matter of, again, starting a discussion. And certainly what we don't want is to delay a process of thinking about what the best way is to regulate things. And yeah. if such a commission means another two or three years of, of public debate that, that actually um, brings together the opinions that we already no, know I'm, about. I'm, I'm, I'm referring a bit to Norway, where they're sort of planning now the introduction of GMOs. They first do a, a, a differentiated risk assessment. So, yeah, and then, that's a, that's a specific but the second assessment. step is yeah. that uh, that they look at the the, the, the societal uh, benefits and to the, the sustainability aspect, and that's done by a broader commission. But I'm not sure. It might be a, 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 a lot but of that's talking. That's after the the, uh, the GM has already been defined. Yes. And the first, the committee you refer to on the GMOs in the Netherlands was before on the yeah. whole principle. Yeah. So I think you have to be very careful with, with risk assessments that they are reasonable, that they don't last forever, that they don't answer all the questions because there will be many questions that we can't answer, but they, that they set the stage for the risks that we now know about, but above all, that we set the stage for assessing the risks that may come up when we don't, don't know everything yet. Okay, any, oh, there's some questions popping up even. <laughs> Yes, first one. How should the public be involved with CRISPR policy when gene editing requires a somewhat scientific background? We just talked a bit about that, but uh, Ernst is going around. Any questions from the audience? Speaking. <laughs> there, in the back. <laughs> We'll do it a little bit careful, I think. Yeah, you should throw it. <laughs> Is it working? Yeah. Yes. 
So uh, accessibility has uh, been a very important value to the use of CRISPR. Um, however, as uh, Luis Fesco says, there is no we. Um, and there are many stakeholders, cowboys included. And he announced his decision, uh, sorry, his genetic adaptations, but maybe some people around have not announced it and still have done it. So my question is, within your proposed legal framework, how do we minimize the risk of those who neglect um, the guidelines or public opinion? The, the cowboys, you mean? Yeah, but cowboys, of course, exist all the time in every field. And fraud or, you know, willing bending of the rules should be punished under a legal system. I mean, it's, it's very simple. You can, if, if something is the law, then it is the law and it should be uh, persecuted if necessary. Now, the trouble is, of course, that there are countries where this uh, kind of monitoring may not become law. And that's where we have we have a problem. So, so that's why I'm uh, making such a plea for an intergovernmental agreement. Um, I think the, the good example uh, is not so much UPOF or uh, or TRIPS, but is, for example, the climate agreement. At least there, we have uh, agreement of all member countries, and it is being translated into national standards and law. And possibly for this, but not just for CRISPR, but for for wider genetic technology improvements also in other fields apart from agriculture and, and health, we should have uh, a, an international system with a follow-up legislation at national level so that you have a, uh, including a court of appeal and so on and so forth. That will take a while. I, I, I realize that. But if we don't do it, then we have indeed no tools, as you rightly say. Okay. And then there would be a biological weapons convention for... There is a biological yeah, weapons convention. Yeah, there is. Convention. So you convention. can use that as well, maybe. Yeah, it doesn't include, as far as I know, genetics. Um, it includes all kinds of other biological compounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, we'll see. Uh, the second question on the uh, suppose supposing we can educate politicians, how could we educate them on biotechnology? Well, I think that's a, that's a very good question, and I think that's a very serious issue because uh, I mean the the politicians they they they. They decide on, on, on where to, to draw the line, whether what is allowed or not. And I, I think, or I have the feeling that, 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 that they really need to be educated uh, still. So, so, I mean, together with some people, uh, with Aaron and some other people that are around here, uh, the other day we were invited to go to uh, Den Haag, uh, so to, to meet our politicians, and I uh, was kind of disappointed uh, in that whole uh, oh. discussion, I must how, say. How come, how come? No, how come? Uh, I mean, maybe because they, uh, I think what is key in this whole uh, discussion is, is, is to com compare what you can accomplish uh, or, or look at the products, so, so the product of CRISPR and the product of, uh, of classical uh, mutagenesis, and, if, 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 and, and then on the basis of that, uh, decide uh, where to draw the line, wh what is allowed or not. And, mm -hmm. and uh, if, if they are not aware of, 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 of the biological background, uh, then mm -hmm. I think it, it will be a very tough uh, discussion, uh, only based on, on, on the feelings of the public. And of course we should, we should take the feelings of the public seriously, but we should also uh, take the, the, the solid scientific evidence uh, seriously. Yeah, yeah. I That's always come back from The Hague with an acute depression in any case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it because there's this, uh, this, this debate in Holland between the ecologist and no, the technologist? No, it's not that. I think more and more politicians, because they don't know the area very well, um, start thinking in terms of regulating a process rather than regulating outcomes you say. So, so that's a very important part. Uh, the process is very complicated, but the outcomes, uh, what is desired, are things that we can talk about them, but we shouldn't mix them necessarily in the same discussion. And secondly, of course, um, politicians are driven by fear, particularly fear of, of citizens. And uh, if I take another example, which has been very clear, this is about um, high tension electricity lines. There's ample evidence that they, they do not cause cancer, but it's enough for one little village somewhere saying we have three cases of leukemia and therefore electricity lines are very dangerous. So there is another decision in parliament to do yet another risk assessment. Like the and vaccine debate. Oh, the vac vaccine. vaccination, yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's very important that we also get a discussion beyond CRISPR-Cas about what is risk in a modern society and who has responsibility for what risks and how do we assess uh, the hazards and the probability, uh, the, the elements of risk, and how do we deal with risk? Because we have been, certainly in Western countries, in Europe and, and in parts of the US, so um, 
uh, much exposed to a nearly risk-free environment, that people are afraid of risks that they cannot manage themselves. Everybody takes a car to drive and exposes him or herself mm. to risk. But this is a kind of un, um, an intangible risk, uh, uh, a risk that people feel, feel uncomfortable about. So that is what we need to address with politicians, the risk is uh, issue and the process versus product issue. Because first you have to explain the difference between hazard and risk, probably. Well, yeah, but it's not a matter of explaining, because then we are again communicating in ascending mode. It's a matter of listening to what is beyond any resistance or lack of understanding and, and, and sort of try to analyze what are people really afraid of. Yeah, but, oh, well, okay, the, but, but still people, not only politicians, are in a frame, a certain kind of frame, and you have to have a, a very strong narrative to get yeah. through. Yeah. Yeah, and that has to be a risk narrative, because I think this does not apply to, to this kind of uh, genetic um, uh, improvements, but the whole IT, uh, uh, big data, digitalization um, debate, which is parallel to this one, has the same issues of risk and lack of understanding. And so this, these are sort of meta-level discussions that we need to have, but really discussions to make an ourselves also as scientists understand what it is that motivates people to to feel so resistant to change yeah. okay there's room for one last question from the audience where no, yeah. Um, yeah the question was just raised uh, by Luisa Fresco who is we uh, <laughs> but then again the question also who is society is that every single individual in the Netherlands Europe or in the world well, yeah, I could give a flippant answer in saying it's everybody who expresses him or herself on social media, but I think <laughs> society is slightly more than that. I think societies uh, are full of people who have certain opinions. There are a lot of people, not in this room, but there are a lot of people out there who have no opinion on CRISPR-Cas, or even don't know what CRISPR-Cas is. But generally, you know, you want um, people to grow towards understanding certain things. I mean, and that is a very slow process. We've had electricity for 200 years, yet I dare most people in the street to, to explain to me how electricity really works. And you may not need to understand everything, yeah, but in our educational system, right at the start of primary school, we need to make understand that children un know something about how progress actually comes into being, what technology means in our societies, what risk is, and, and this, this is an educational process that should go right through society and even include the politicians if they have been to school, which we don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm no, being flippant. But. <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, well, we never can stop discussing this kind of subject, but we have to stop because otherwise the program will run out. Uh, it's difficult to get a conclusion out of this. I, what I get is that we have to go, to go forward, but carefully and taking as much people along as, as we can by using communication and uh, debate. And uh, let's see what, uh, what comes out of it. If this, in this, with these new tools. So thank Perfect. you very much, John. And uh, thank you. okay, thank you very much.